Uh, we at DSU welcome all the participants to this uh, two-day workshop on research and publication ethics. We have with us uh, Dr. Banga, uh, Dean Research at DSU, Professor Captain Nagraj, uh, Dean of PG Programs in Management, who will be addressing the participants after me. So we welcome both of you to this workshop, sir. We have uh, resource persons, Dr. Krishna Kumar Rao, Dr. V. Reddy, Dr. M. Krishnamurti, and Dr. Pratima Guru Prasad, who will share their wisdom on various constituents of uh, research and publication ethics. On behalf of DSU, I thank all of them for sparing their valuable time to address the participants. We welcome you to this workshop, sir, and madam. We welcome uh, Dean Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Vaibhav from the School of Engineering. I also welcome uh, Dr. Anupama, Assistant Registrar at Research Cell, and my colleague Dr. Payal, who have helped me in the coordination of this workshop. Uh, the objective of this workshop is to comprehend research philosophy and ethics, scientific conduct, publication ethics, open access publications, uh, research metrics, indexing and citation database, and plagiarism software tools. When we come to plagiarism, plagiarism research for fraud, undisclosed competing interests, these are just a few of the issues that can th threaten not only the integrity of science, but also one standing in the scientific community. An understanding of the ethical boundaries and rules is paramount to ensuring that your work and career get off to the best start possible. So the top five reasons to publish the research ethically are the first one, the scientific community thrives only when each participant publishes with integrity. The second reason is there's no comparison to good work getting published and being able to get credits and accolades for a job well done. A published paper is a permanent record of your work. The third reason is publishing ethically ensures that we have trusted information on which to build future technologies, policies, and therapies. A good reputation and acting with integrity opens the door to opportunities. Doing the right thing sets an example and reinforces our respons responsibility to our peers and society at large. So with this tone of publishing research ethically. Uh, we inaugurate the two-day workshop on research and publication ethics, which is scheduled for today and tomorrow, that is August 5th and 6th of 2020. Now I request Dr. Banga, Dean Research at DSU, to address the participants. Good morning, everybody. Uh, at the outset, uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Rashtri and Dr. Payal uh, for organizing this uh, workshop of two days. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, Professor Rashtri, uh, once you know, on the, when I was you know, walking in the corridor, she came to me and said, sir, we want to uh, arrange one uh, workshop. Uh, I said, great, because that is need of the hour. In fact, I was you know, uh, in fact, you know, discussing with the uh, Professor Dr. Krishna Kumar Rao earlier also, that UGC has made uh, research publication ethics as one of the mandatory courses for uh, the PhD scholars and also for young field uh, in the students. And uh, UGC is also planning to offer uh, this you know, say, particular course of two, two credits uh, to uh, even the masters in uh, uh, the students. If you ask me, I think this is the course which is required by everybody. In fact, even our BTEC students right in our university have been doing a lot of uh, research because there is a thrust on uh, uh, undergraduate research. Whether the students are in uh, undergraduation or post-graduation or MPhil or uh, PhD programs, all of them uh, will do a lot of research and they need to publish as the madam was saying very rightly. Now, many a time we may publish something without knowing, probably we have uh, unknowingly, uh, you know, copied something from somebody else's you know, say, publication. So such things should not happen. 
it is more so in the case of you no know, uh, phd program where uh, the scholars will have to do a lot of you know, research and publish their finding in uh, say journals and in you know, a conferences it is a must as such as per the guidelines of you know, phd program so when they are trying to publish you know, say uh, their finding research findings naturally they have to go by the a lot of you know, say uh, guidelines and these guidelines are laid out in this you no know, uh, two uh, credit course which comprises all the topics that are there in this particular workshop research in a philosophy and ethics scientific you know, conduct a uh, publication ethics open access and publishing of one should know as to what it is and the plagiarism software tools whether it is whether it is opened or turn it in people should know as to how to use it and how to decipher as to what are the uh, uh, whatever has come as a report and uh, also the databases and research and metrics uh, these are the, the uh, six broad topics which are there in this you know, course and everything has been covered in this you know, workshop and uh, madam is also uh, getting it recorded whatever uh, deliberations that take place uh, it is great it will be you know useful for everybody not just for phd scholars but others as well now uh, the second part now i should really congratulate you now uh, dr rashri and dr payal for having got uh, stalwarts from industry as well as academic you know, science institutions to deliver the you know, sessions uh, right today we have got uh, dr krishna kumar ra with the long experience in uh, uh, industry uh, and uh, uh, an alumnus of you no know, say i am you no know, say uh, kolkata Uh, to deliver uh, the first session, and uh, the other say experts who are there, really I I appreciate uh, the effort of you say uh, the team to get these you uh, know uh, experts, and uh, uh, the database and research in you know, a matrix where of course there are a lot of computer science related uh, in information need to be uh, put forth uh, that will be taken by my own colleague Dr. Pratima Guru Prasad. so that way we have got you no know, say uh, five excellent speakers i request all the participants whether they are uh, research scholars or mba uh, students to make the best use of this particular workshop and uh, internalize whatever uh, is being you know, say uh, deliberated uh, in this two days workshop with this uh, let me wish all the participants excellent learning in these two days and uh, uh, let me thank in advance uh, the resource persons who have been drafted uh, to conduct sessions as part of this workshop with this let me conclude thank thanks one and all thank you sir uh, uh, for your valuable inputs and actually the concept of this workshop uh, basically uh, we thought of it uh, when i went and met Uh, captain sir uh, and i told him that sir uh, we have this topic uh, do you have anybody in the mba uh, resource uh, that somebody could talk about these uh, topics and sir was really helpful in getting me the resource person so i should really thank uh, uh, captain sir uh, for uh, organizing all the resource persons and thank you very much sir and uh, i request uh, captain uh, nagraj sir dean pg programs in management to address the participants thank you madam uh, it's a pleasure to be here i must congratulate uh, the anand sagar university its management uh, dr mk banga uh, and you uh, dr rajshree narendra for organizing this so like has has been said 2019 the ugc passed a resolution that uh, this must be a two credit course mentioned by dr banga but then you know that's a thought that's an idea the execution is always important and hence uh, you and your team must be congratulated for putting this together and making this happen um as you mentioned i am the dean for the mba program as well as the executive mba program and uh, i see a great many students coming to our portals what is of course very um, a little bit of a challenge and disappointing is the fact that many of them do not understand the ethicality of uh, publishing uh, the ethicality 
uh, of um, you know plagiarizing somebody else's work and uh, hence these kind of workshops that you have organized under the ages of dhanan sagar university and the two day workshop on research and publication ethics are so important i believe that this must filter down and get into you know primary education as well so that people understand that they cannot pass off somebody else's work as their own uh, as we go forward so um, uh, there is something rotten in the system if we copy um, somebody else's work and pass it off as our own and i think it's very important that people understand this very clearly and who greater than academicians and potential academicians and people who want to do research and publish because in many ways academicians are role models for a much of society and people look up uh, to people like um, us for um, you know how we conduct ourselves uh, in many areas uh, so we all understand what are what is morality what is ethical ethicality what is plagiarism and what is right and wrong i am also very pleased to see uh, some of my colleagues on this program uh, we have of course uh, dr krishna kumar rao who is we go back many years as does dr venkat muni reddy um, both of them outstanding academicians as well as industry persons they have done a lot of consulting um, and publication in their own right um, so thank you very much madam for inviting me to speak and i will not hold back the program i uh, thank you uh, for arranging this as of course dr banga who's always a very senior and inspiring figure at dhanan sagar university and uh, thank you so much and i I'll, i'll keep in touch and of course welcome to all the participants uh, and thank you for being here on this program thank you sir for your valuable input uh, so we have uh, four resource persons Uh, the first session will be handled by dr krishna kumar rao uh, the session in the afternoon today will be handled by uh, dr reddy from mahi and uh, tomorrow session morning early morning it will be handled handled by dr krishna murthy from uh, indian uh, statistical institute at bangalore and uh, the last session for the day for tomorrow Uh, will be handled by Dr. Pratima Guru Prasad, who is a computer science faculty. So she will be talking about the plagiarism tools and so the software tools that are used for indexing and uh, uh, research metrics. So let us start this first session uh, right now. So let me introduce Dr. Krishna Kumar Rao, uh, resource person for the session on research philosophy and ethics. Professor Dr. Krishna Kumar V Rao is currently serving as adjunct faculty at DSU. Dr. Krishna Kumar Rao is an accomplished uh, educator, industry and business veteran with over three decades of good standing. He is alumnus of the prestigious Indian Institute of Management, Kolkata, where from where he holds his holds his master's degree with specialization in wireless and electronics and psychology, as well as MPhil and PhD in marketing. and human resource interface he has international certifications in the multiple areas of coaching mentoring and neuro linguistic programming he specializes in strategic management various areas in marketing hrm with leadership and team team development for the past 13 years he has multi domain experience in india and abroad heading organizations in senior most positions He has also held position as regional director of a learning institute. He was also director in an ad agency. He served as president of Lions Club. He was a visiting faculty in his industry career period to IIMs, IIT, and NIT. Now he also consults for FM, FMCG, pharma, tech, and technical and startup organizations in strategic and performance ex- excellence areas. We welcome Dr. Krishna Kumar Rao to address the participant, and I hand over this session on research philosophy and ethics to you, sir. Sir, you'll be taking over. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, welcome, uh, sir. Thank you, uh, Imtiaz. Uh, shall I start sharing the screen? Yes, sir. You can share, sir. So 
Good morning, uh, everybody. It's morning. Over, overwhelming. More than 300 uh, participants. I mean, all the credit goes to Dr. Rajshree and uh, her colleague to get so many people at short notice interested in this program. And more than that, more than 50% of them electronically present today uh, makes me a kind of nervous. I've been uh, most of my life a kind of commercial animal working in industry and business. But even then, the academic bug was always in me. So I had uh, dabbled in uh, teaching, education, training, etc. for long. The last 13 years, of course, as I was ever mentioning, I've been into very much teaching and consultancy. As I said, you know, my background has been mostly wireless, electronics, and uh, FMCG, etc. I've been a science student with strong background in mathematics, then later on technology. And to dabble in a subject like philosophy and ethics is a real challenge. But still, manfully I've taken up the challenge because uh, my very good uh, colleague, my kind of mentor in academics for the last 10 years, Professor Nagaraj Rao, so he has always been supporting me. So with the kind of backing I have with all the people, I'll get into this uh, discussion. So I'm not really addressing anything. I'm not uh, competent or I'm not proficient to do that. I would rather introduce the subject of philosophy and ethics more as a kind of discussion amongst uh, equals. And let's see how it goes. At the end of my presentation, we will take uh, various questions and then we will see how we can exchange views so that it can be a kind of uh, education for me as well. So with this, a few words, let me start the session. So we're all coming in as strangers, most of them, most of us. But I'm sure this will be an occasion from when we'll be moving forward as friends. And maybe we'll have a lot of networking, mutual help on various issues. So it's a wonderful day. And um, obviously, our institution, DSU, beloved Vice Chancellor, Register, sir, and Banga, sir, Dean, Research, and um, Professor Nagaraj, sir, Dean of MBA, and Rajshri Narendra and Payal Verma. They need to be congratulated by all the researchers for this opportunity to sit together rather electronically and be there for two days at no cost to listen to, to ponder over various aspects of research publication thesis so that not only we get benefited individually, but we can also benefit the society at large and we owe that to the society as the privileged lot among the society. We owe duty to the society. Now, people on the panel, we have introduced ourselves, but unfortunately, the time doesn't permit to go ahead exhaustively to introduce uh, the participants individually. Uh, but uh, a week before, I had sent a very, very small questionnaire uh, to each one of the participants, and they have filled in the detail and sent to us a wonderful galaxy of people right, from northwest of India to northeast of India and to deep south, and very, very accomplished people in their own right, from PhD, MTech, uh, MPhil, MTech scholars to MBA students. Thank you, everybody. So let us uh, dwell a little more deeper into this uh, subject. So much has been said about me. I don't have to read this through. In the past two decades, particularly in India, the interest in research has not just been expanding, but has been exploding. Not only the academia, 
the business, the industry, all of them are very much keen to research various aspects, conducting basic, basic research, and more so lots and lots of applied research in various areas. Much of it is happening in uh, management, in engineering and technology these days. So when uh, the quantity increases, that too very rapidly, obviously somewhere or other, there could be some hitches and somewhere the quality might suffer. When I say quality, it may not be necessarily in terms of the research process or content itself. But in terms of overall approach to conducting research and then being truthful and honest to the self, to the colleagues and to the society. Therefore, it is probably not too late in the day which necessitates some kind of specific guidelines so that the processes are laid out properly. And also we can sanitize a certain section of research community so that we will have orderly systematic conduct of research for the common good of the society. Now, very recently, within the last, uh, let's say seven, eight months or something, precisely 9th August, 2019, UGC came out and mandated a two credit hour course on research and publication ethics. And they made it compulsory for all. For all mean, basically for PhD students and also for MPhil students. And they also extended for interested faculty members. And they are also going to be made available this program to postgraduate students at a later date. It's a very welcome step as uh, Dr. Banga, as well as uh, Professor Rajshree and uh, Professor Nagaraj said, now every one of us, even at undergraduate level these days, are into some kind of study, some kind of research as a part of course completion. So it's very good to start as it were, right at the beginning, so that when the current crop of uh, the undergraduate students, when they move to graduation, they finish graduation, move to post-graduation, and then take up research, many of them, right? Maybe in the academic area, maybe in the applied research area, then this will become very handy for all the people. Now the two credits, will not only be added to academic credits, but this will also evaluate the very eligibility to take the PhD course, according to the Vice Chairman of UGC, uh, Mr. Patwarthi. Now, many experts have written over the last couple of years on the adequacy or the inadequacy of the research and the research process and the proper applicability of the research and more so in terms of the dissemination of knowledge arising out of the vast amount of research taking place in various areas. And many of us are now exposed to the new education policy. And as per that, they are probably planning to do away the MPhil altogether so that straight away, the road is clear to go for PhD. And then that means right from undergraduate stage in the case of engineers and technologists, or from the postgraduate stage in the case of business management students and other science students to get into PhD research. So it becomes very, very necessary to get a feel of what they mean by this particular program. And UGC also has come out with uh, recognized journals called the CAD list, and then suggested that research papers are supposed to be published only within the CAD list of journals, so that there is some kind of rigor and some kind of uniformity in terms of the actual publication. Of course, I have my learned colleagues, far more learned than me, who will be talking about these aspects 
in the afternoon and tomorrow. And very kind of uh, unnerving statistics where UGC report said, Indians have contributed to 35% of all articles published in fake journals. I don't think we should do with this kind of notoriety. notoriety. So rather we should keep moving forwards to bringing down this percentage to almost zero or nil as early as possible. And they also said in the report that data manipulation and plagiarism are issues of great concern. Some of it I will touch upon, but rest of it I will leave it to my learned colleagues in the other sessions. They have said further, the quality of research paper produced in India is not good, and we are aware about this. Apart from complaints of plagiarism, there's also urgent need to teach people about the ethics of conducting the research and also ethics in the publication so that future complaints can be avoided. Says the UGC Secretary Rajinish Jain, very guarded but powerful statement. Right? I suppose all of us understand the deep long term implications of this statement. Anyway, this is not the stage for us to get more into a kind of philosophical discussion about what has been said or so. But let's see practically how all of us as part of academic and research community can do a little bit. Now UGC will include in the syllabus, philosophy, ethics, scientific conduct, so that the desirability of intellectual honesty and the undesirability of falsification, fabrication, plagiarism in the research process. Or there's nothing to teach as such. I simply use the words given in their uh, communication. So it's actually we should, uh, the students, the research scholars made aware and not only made aware but also imbibe this as part of their culture, research culture, and that's what is required. And UGC further goes on to say, a module on open access publishing is also necessary. So how to use open sources like data and how to interpret it in a correct way. Now these days, there has been data explosion, not just expansion, and all kinds of data. So now we all of us have a tendency to Google and to go internet and look at all kinds of data. And in our urgency, we, some, we immediately start looking at various data and then start working on them. But how many times do we pass to ask legitimately whether this data is reliable, whether this data is acceptable? So this is one of the things which probably all of us, because all of us are also in continuous research. We are not, we can't isolate the scholars and students. So all of us will have to look at any data, any secondary data, which is available. We'll have to be looked at and we'll have to carefully elucidate whether this particular data, which we are seeing is from trusted sources and whether it is worth and whether we are not doing disservice to the original authors of the data. And UGC also has plugged in to teach about the ills of misconduct and uh, enough of past examples of fraud complaints from India and abroad, particularly about copyright issues, knowingly or unknowingly. And they will also want to popularize pleasure some tools like turn it in. So the UGC mandated course will handle three items under the theory and knowledge areas, philosophy and ethics, scientific conduct, publication ethics. And in the practice and skill areas, which means there will be some kind of hands-on or hand-holding in these areas needed, open access publishing, 
publication misconduct, databases, and research metrics. So today, I have the pleasure and privilege to put forth some of my views on philosophy and ethics as being applied to the research. Um, as I enunciate some of these points in the foregoing PPTs and my discussion, I'm sure many of you would have a lot of uh, questions to ask. Your curiosity might have been going up. And I would only request to hold it and type it out in the chat box. And by end of the presentation, we'll take it up one by one for two reasons. One, the trend of thinking would be maintained. And number two, there could be multiple uh, clarifications, which may be somewhat similar. So we could bunch them together and handle at the end of this presentation. So kindly cooperate. And for me, particularly, compared to many other veterans in this particular group, uh, I'm still a youngster. Set aside my age, that's different because age is just a number. So this workshop is also a very good learning process for me to polish up my knowledge and also learn many, many things which probably I had missed along the way. Okay. Now, in the context of research, if you are going to talk about philosophy and ethics, researchers are fundamentally responsible for advancing knowledge in whatever the field that they are working on. But in doing so, the basic ethical and legal norms have to be complied with. Now, when ethical and legal norms have to be complied with, in all such cases, in terms of uh, complying to norms, procedures, and also the various acts, many times people come out with saying that, sir, we are not aware, or we didn't have clarity on that. But unfortunately, the saying goes, as that ignorance of law is no excuse. Therefore, irrespective of what has happened so far, let us probably now start learning what should be the proper ethical and legal norms and how do we proceed further by imbibing those requirements in us. Now, on the researchers, we are insisting on their being ethical and legal. And the outcome, whatever comes out of it, right, is being used in the society and it has got social, political, cultural impact. And this outcome, we don't know how it is being used. The case of atom bomb, the case of various uh, gadgets, the case of various facilities, new findings, everything. There's always a positive side. There's always a negative side, the underbelly, the dark area. So it's very, very important, not just to look at the process and the findings, but perhaps in the application area also, all of us, even the beneficiaries of research and the policy makers, they should also be responsible for looking at the impact assessment of the research and the outcome. So because of this fragmented approach so far, the kind of silo approach, the isolated approach in various research institutions with various scholars across various places. Right? Now, also with emerging technologies available in multiple scale to various in various countries, this, all of them have now led to the recent absence to focus once again what is the impact of philosophy and ethics and research? Now, we are in the era of STEM, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, cloud computing, so on and so forth, and many more. Maybe I have left out a couple of 
other things as well. For STEM, all of us know science, technology, engineering, maths. Now, it's almost now out of fashion. In fact, when somebody says, are you doing research in which area? If he's talking about something in social studies and humanities, people are a little hesitant and shy because the in thing is to be doing research in all these emerging technology and technology application areas. Now, there's a very nice book by George Anders. You can do anything, the surprising power of a useless liberal arts education. Now, he says, the human touch has never been more essential in the workplace than it is today. The job market is quietly creating thousands of openings for people who can bring a humanist grace to a rapidly evolving high-tech future. Therefore, the temperance by philosophy and ethics in engineering, technology, and science. Now, this will bring forth fruits of research finding in a humane way to the society and not look at only about the efficiency, effectiveness, and productivity aspects of operations and as well as in research. Fine. Why are we meeting today in the context of UGC? In the context of research, we call it as PhD. And the basis of PhD, which is perhaps the highest academic qualification every person aspires to achieve, is that every scholar should attempt an original thesis, not the words, original thesis. And we are expected to offer a significant new contribution to the knowledge in their chosen subject. I have been looking at uh, many research papers and I've been interacting with many research scholars in the last uh, one decade or so. Um, some of the topics chosen and some of the way it's being done, I don't want to get into that at this stage. There's not the forum for that. So the key, I will say, originality, original thesis, and whether it contributes some new knowledge in this chosen subject, and not repeating something else done somewhere else for the purpose of getting this qualification. Now, even the full title, right? If you see, we all been saying PhD, but what's PhD? It is Doctor of Philosophy. So why Doctor of Philosophy? It's got some mysterious ring. So have I become a doctor? Everybody calls me doctor. It's not that kind of doctor. Now, when I say doctor of philosophy, have I studied philosophy deeply? No. Probably many of us haven't, unless we want to. So what is the connection? Why we are talking about philosophy when we have done the ultimate research and obtain PhD, probably in management, maybe in engineering, maybe in technology, or etc. Of course, it starts from the Latin term, philosophy, doctor. The word philosophy here refers to the original meaning. Philo means friend or lover of wisdom. So originally, this signified to those individuals who had achieved a comprehensive general education in the fundamental issues of the present world. Today, of course, with uh, lots and lots of uh, specialization, subspecialization, the generality has lost. And the doctor philosophy, but still requires the love of wisdom as it applies to individuals who are pursuing the knowledge even in much more specialized field, any of the discipline, particularly even in the STEM areas. So we will broadly talk about the philosophy and ethics as it applies to research, bereft of jargons and hard stuff, because of paucity of time, then there's not the occasion. And as Dr. Bonga said, maybe later, when this is converted into a full-fledged course and in universities, we will take that forum to dwell much deeper into it. 
So whatever I'm discussing today, whatever I've discussed so far is based on my experience, my collection of readings in multiple places. So please take it as it is and then see how we can discuss further and benefit mutually. So what we are trying to do, rather I'm trying to do is to get an outsider's glimpse to these two subjects. So philosophy is concerned with making explicit the nature and significance of ordinary and scientific beliefs and investigating intelligibly the concepts by means of importance, rational argument concerning the presuppositions, implications, and interrelationships. And when we talk about rational investigation of the nature and the structure of reality, that area is called metaphysics. And when we are talking about the resources and the limits of knowledge, we call it as epistemology. And when you're talking about the moral aspect, the principle and import of moral judgment involved in this study, we call it as ethics. So develop philosophy, its origin is wisdom, which is different from knowledge. Because knowledge accumulation can take place, right, in any number of ways, but applying that knowledge is very, very important. So I've read, acquiring knowledge is enough, but don't stop there because applying knowledge is important so that the skills are developed. Don't stop there. Acquiring skills are not enough and we will have to apply them. And not only we should apply them appropriately, but we should also be doing it ethically. We should also have the right type of temperament and attitude so that that generates the right amount of uh, benefit to the industry, business, and the society. So in that way, philosophy is a way of thinking about the world, the universe, and the society. It asks the basic fundamental questions of the basic human thought, the nature of the universe, the connections between various aspects that we see. In a way, the ideas in philosophy, the hardcore philosophy, are often gentle and seem to be abstract. But the philosophy is actually about the real world as we see, as we observe, and as we infer. And that's exactly, that's exactly what researchers are supposed to do. See, observe, comprehend, infer, communicate. And ethics, for example, is all about how to be good in our day-to-day -day lives. Metaphysics, part of it, asks about how the world works and what it is made of and how it is relevant to us. Sometimes people talk about personal philosophy. No, no, my philosophy is to X, Y, Z. My philosophy is not to do this. My philosophy is to do something, something. Fine, that is the way a person thinks about the world. So through his paradigm, what he is thinking about something is what he's expressing. But here we are not talking about the individual's paradigm, the way of thinking, but what we are discussing is about the common acceptable philosophy as it may apply to research and not about people's personal philosophies as it applies to individual or his self. Now it's very interesting, many of us have noted that all major science, physical sciences, natural sciences, all these disciplines, some centuries back, were all considered part of philosophy. They are all offshoots from philosophy. As the speculation about nature analysis became more and more developed, and these subjects started branching away. And this process continues. Now, psychologists again is one of the splits 
from philosophy. Decision theory, applied ethics, and many such studies have all branched out basically from philosophy. Today we are looking at the parts, we are not looking at the whole. So understanding the basis of philosophy probably is useful because this will help us to look at new kinds of science and new disciplines as we move forward. When you look at things as a whole and not in fragmented fashion. Philosophy inquires into the nature of matter, time, space, causality, evolution, mind, etc. But the fundamental thing about philosophy is it's the art of thinking all the things logically, systematically, and persistently. And also thinking rationally, systematically, of the reality as a whole. Again, does it not resonate? It is again, it is what a researcher is supposed to do. Thinking is a hard job. Rational thinking is still harder. So philosophy, I would say, is a coherent understanding of everything put together, a kind of synoptic view of the universe around us. One more approach as being more of a practical person, that's what I claim to be. Philosophy is the activity of working out the right way of thinking about things. Now, distinguish about thinking about things and working out the right way of thinking about things. Am I confusing? Thinking about things is very important. Now, working out how to think about things the right way is even more important. So in the second case, what do we do? We step back from what we are doing or what we are trying to do and start asking questions about what are the presuppositions? What we are doing? Is it the right way of doing things? So when doing physics, I had been a student of physics and subsequently I moved over to Wireless, wireless and electronics, et cetera, et cetera, later. We investigate the physical reality by constructing experiments, measurements, formulating theories, et cetera. But when I talk about the philosophy of physics, we'll be asking, what do we mean by physical reality? How do experiment results confirm or disconfirm a certain hypothesis? Or what distinguishes a good scientific theory from a bad one. Theory anybody can propose, right? Again, economics says anybody can propose a theory and the theory stands for some time till it is challenged. When it is challenged, there comes something called antithesis. And antithesis starts getting more and more prevalent. And the thesis and antithesis are debated ferociously and there appears some kind of synthesis and the synthesis in due course becomes a thesis and then the process goes on. Now, what about medicine? When we practice medicine, what are we basically trying to do? Heal the people, treat the people according to current best medical theories. A classic example, is the COVID case. What are we doing now? We're all grappling in the dark. We know that something is terribly wrong. We know we want to do something. Everybody is desperate the world over. But, this, but we still don't know how. The vaccine is far away. All shortcuts are being done. Nowhere in the history of science shortcuts have ever worked. They're all like bandaging right in an accident case just for the time being it doesn't help so but when we do the philosophy of medicine what do we do we step back and think whether the concepts of these medical theories do they make sense and what the health and sickness really mean are we doing symptomatic treatment and research are we are we going deeper 
into the aspects of it. So all of them are actually essence of philosophy. I talked about thinking, thinking about thinking the right way. What is right? One way of saying is correct. The meaning of right can be correct. So it's a correct way of thinking. So we say what or which is correct. But then we need a reference point because any superlatives always have a reference point. So a, a priori intuition or after experiencing or experimenting, some kind of reference point we say and then say correct or we were correct or now we want to be correct, etc. But the another interesting way of looking at the right is we can say the right way, meaning the creative side of the brain. Now, creativity comes to every one of us, right? It's not like somebody is creative, somebody is not. It's a matter of opportunity. It's a matter of training. Whether through conscious effort or unconscious reaction, it is unique in each one of us. It's a vital concept, the way we think. Now, the best way to improve our ability to think, perhaps, is to spend time thinking about it. Uh, MTS, I want to share a small video at this stage. Can you help me do that? Sir, I think you can also share it, sir. No, I want the then the screen share it. Okay. I'll just do oh, that. Okay, okay. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, in tears. Yeah, yeah, but video is coming now. Just see. It's not coming. No, sir, video is not there, sir.
Okay, shop the chair, yeah. Mm. Share the screen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, correct. Uh. of our philosophy MOOC. So in this week of the course, our job is to try and understand a bit about what philosophy as a subject is. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you what yeah. I think philosophy is, and then I'm going to try and illustrate that conception of philosophy by talking a bit about how that relates it to some other subjects. Then we're going to move on to thinking about how some other features of philosophy follow from that definition of philosophy that I'll have given you. Then we're going to move on to thinking about how we actually go about doing philosophy. And we're going to do that by looking at our first couple of examples of philosophical arguments and thinking about how we should understand them and criticize them. Then finally, we're going to finish by thinking about what it might mean to look for the best way or the right way of thinking about something. And we're going to look at the views of a couple of great philosophers from history who are going to help us think about that question. So let's get started. What is philosophy? Well, it's a difficult question to answer. And I think the best answer that we can give is a very simple one. Philosophy is just the activity that philosophers get up to. So. One important thing about that is that philosophy isn't just a subject, it's an activity that we have to engage in, it's something that we have to do. And to really get a good sense of what it is to engage in it, what it is to do it, and to do it well, you're going to have to do more than just listen to what I have to say about philosophy this week. The best way to work out what that activity is all about and how to be good at it is going to be to work your way through the course and try to engage and think about and understand all the different topics and problems and arguments that we're going to consider there. So by doing that, you'll hopefully get a much better sense of what philosophy is um, all about than I'm going to be able to give you this week. But I can at least try and make a start on saying what I think philosophy is. And here's the definition that I'm going to be working with, with this week. I think that philosophy is the activity of working out the best way to think about things. So, what do I mean by that? Well, let's clarify it first of all by thinking about how that relates it to some other subjects. So one question that you might have immediately about that definition is, don't all subjects try and think about things in the right way? Okay, from astronomy to zoology. Everything tries to think about whatever topic or domain it's concerned with in the right way. And I think that that's true. But I think that what the philosopher needs to say in response to it is to distinguish between the activity of getting on with thinking in a particular way and the activity of stepping back from that way of thinking and working out the right way to think about things. So it's that distinction between thinking in a particular way and working out whether some way of thinking is the right way that I think corresponds to the distinction between some particular academic subject and doing philosophy about that subject. So let's take physics as an example. If you're a physicist, then you do things like um, collect data, um, do measurements, construct experiments, and try and build theories on that basis. Okay, When you're doing that, you're getting on with the activity and the way of thinking that's characteristic of physics. But we can step back from the activity of doing physics and thinking in that way that we do when we're doing physics. And we can ask questions like, what is it for data to confirm or refute a theory in physics? What are we doing when we're trying to measure reality? And what does it even mean to try and understand reality 
in terms of its basic physical constituents. So when we step back from the actual process of doing physics in that way and start asking questions about the ways of thinking and the ways of carrying on that we're employing when we're doing physics, then we're making the transition from doing physics to doing the philosophy of physics. Okay. We're stepping back and trying to work out the right way of thinking about things. So for our second example, I want to think about medicine. Specifically, I want to think about the way they would have practiced or thought about medicine in medieval times. So in those times, as I understand it, they tried to explain all different diseases and tried to treat all different diseases in terms of what they called four humors. So there was blood, black bile, phlegm, and yellow bile. And if you had anything wrong with you, then they tried to understand that disease in terms of some kind of imbalance of those four humours and treat it accordingly. Now, obviously, we don't think about medicine in that way anymore. We don't think that that's the right way to think about diseases and their treatment. So how can that change in our way of thinking come about? Well, one way it could come about is just by us asking questions about what it really means for a disease to be an imbalance of black bile and yellow bile or whatever. So we might just ask ourselves whether we really understand what it means to make that identity claim that a disease just is that. Or we might look at all the other things in the body that seem to also be important to our physical health and the treatment and curing of disease and think that there seems to be a lot of evidence that they seem important to our health as well. So there are things other than blood and bile and phlegm that are important to, to being healthy. How does our medical theory explain that? Or we might just notice that our ways of treating diseases and trying to cure people according to this framework really aren't very successful. Okay, So different ways in which we might be prompted to revise our conception of what the best way of thinking about diseases and how to treat them are. So notice from the quick discussion of physics and that quick discussion of medieval medicine that it looks like there are a couple of different ways that we can be prompted to revise our way of thinking about things, revise our conception of what the best way of thinking in a particular domain is. One sort of way can be making that revision from the inside. So making that revision from just thinking about the subject. So when I was talking about philosophy of physics, I was talking about asking questions such as, what is it for data to confirm or to refute a theory? And those are questions that can change the way that we think about physics just from the armchair, if you will, okay, just by thinking about them. In the case of medicine, I suggested that one way that we might be prompted to revise our medical framework was by thinking about whether or not we really understand what it means for a disease to be an imbalance of different humours. So again, that would be what we might call a challenge to our way of thinking from the inside. Right? We don't have to go out and be confronted by the world to change the way that we're thinking about things in those cases. But another way that we might be prompted to change the way that we're thinking about things is from the outside. So this is probably particularly clear with the example of medieval medicine. So presumably one of the reasons why we don't subscribe to that way of thinking about diseases and their treatment anymore is because we just noticed that it wasn't very successful. Okay, When we try and understand diseases and treat diseases by thinking about them and acting towards them in that way, just a lot of people seem to die and we don't seem to do very well. We might think that we can think about similar examples in physics. So perhaps um, the sorts of discoveries that were made in quantum mechanics at the start of the 20th century might give us examples here. One way you might think about those discoveries is that 
um, they appear to give us results just by looking at the world and doing experiments on it and observing what we found there that seemed to show that we had to really change quite fundamentally some of our notions about how we understand the world. So you might think that some of the results from quantum mechanics put pressure on um, basic intuitions that we have about what it is for one thing to be able to cause another. So there might be results in quantum mechanics that suggest that one thing can instantaneously affect another thing that's very far away from it and that doesn't seem to have any connection to it. There might also be some results from quantum mechanics that suggest that a thing can be like a wave in some respects, but like a particle in some other respects. Whereas it seems that according to our common sense conception of reality, a thing can be either a wave or a particle, but not both. So that's a very quick and crude characterization of some stuff about quantum mechanics. But it's just by way of example um, to suggest how the world can throw up reasons for us to change our way of thinking about things just as surely as we can get reasons just by thinking about it from our armchair. And so it's that feature of philosophy, the feature that by taking our ways of thinking about things out into the world and testing them against the world, um, we can be prompted to change and revise them. That means philosophy has this really close relationship with a lot of other subjects. So in our two examples, we've seen how it can have a close relationship um, with physics and with medicine. By getting on with the business of doing physics and doing medicine, we can be given reason to step back and think about or rethink what we think are our best ways of understanding the world. And this goes for a whole lot of other subjects as well. So for example, in a future week of the course, we're going to be thinking about some issues in the philosophy of mind. And we're going to see how developments in artificial intelligence and computer science led to um, people stepping back and trying to think about new ways to think about what it actually is to have a mind. So in this section, I've suggested that philosophy is the activity of stepping back and working out the right way of thinking about things. And I started off by saying that philosophy, in an important sense, was an activity, not just a subject. So, so far, I've tried to say a little bit about what that activity is and illustrated it with a couple of examples. Uh, we are back. Can you hear me? Hello. 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 Uh, my PPT is coming. Seen? Hello, hello, sir. 
I just did that. Let me one second. Share screen. Okay. Now, okay, PPT is on now. And share. Is it okay now? That is crazy. No. Is it share? Hmm? Yeah, I'll do that. Now it's coming. Yes, sir. We can Voice see. Voice is that. also coming. Now we can see that now. Thanks. Thank you, friends, for your patience. It's again a reminder that I've got many things to learn. This new technology, etc., how to use. Okay. So if I'm audible, we'll proceed further. Everything is seen proper. Can I go ahead? Okay. So we talked about thinking about the right things, thinking about thinking itself. We know the example of Copernicus. Instead of accepting the previously known things, he stepped back and looked at and said, no, the sun has to be the center. Even though all the items in the galaxy are same, now sun has to be in the center. He started thinking differently. And that's how the current modern theory has come up. Therefore, the method of philosophy is not just a reflection, but it's a rational reflection. So experience facts, events, phenomena, and then we should reduce them to system by rational reflection upon each one of them. In that way, it is empirical because it is not diverse from just an experience or a feeling. But looking at philosophically, it cannot be just only numbers, quantitative, but it should be consistent with all the facts of experience so that it is harmonized with one another and becomes a unified system. Science engineering technology, you know, is all about quantitative view rather than qualitative view. So the qualities of things, et cetera, you're also converting into some kind of quantitative formula and mathematical equations. You measure, weigh, compute, describe, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to philosophy, it starts taking a qualitative view of the entire universe. It is not satisfied with only the quantitative formula, which is just a logical abstraction. It considers the qualities, unique features of every individual things and then taken together. That unified, unified thinking is the hallmark of philosophical thinking. Hello, oh, yeah. Observation, experimentation, mm -hmm. etc., are all methods of science. Okay. Now, as we already saw, the philosophical method is a rational reflection and frame for framing hypothesis. Both science and philosophy aim at reducing the complex fact into simpler one. Therefore, science without philosophy are an aggregate without unity, a kind of body without a soul. And philosophy without science is a soul without the body, right? Poetry devoid of its dreams. Okay. Now I'll again raise a fundamental question at this stage. 
maybe just to reconfirm for understanding what is research research we say is a systematic investigation designed to develop generalizable knowledge mm. so focused systematic study undertaken is a kind of inquiry seeking new evidence so that we get new knowledge and new understanding and it's an attempt to find out something in a systematic and scientific manner now we can combine together and then try to kind of explain or define research in this following way research aims to generate new information knowledge understanding or uh, some other relevant cognitive good and does so by means of a systematic investigation analysis interpretation and publication with integrity following sound ethical principles through i think if this kind of explanation or a new definition is generally acceptable by us i think probably this will lay a framework for the entire new attempt that we are trying to do to study the philosophy and ethics in research and the various practical issues which are being given in terms of the process of research and in terms of publicizing the results of the research so purpose of a responsible research not any research i'm talking about a responsible not research for research sake it's a responsible research he is one which is conducted with integrity is the key for a genuine advancement not just for that individual for a limited purpose or for that institution but it is for the country and the society at large so i'll just do some of the things in passing because the intention is not to go deep into teaching philosophy but in terms of understanding philosophy as it applies to research so the key subdivisions of philosophy epistemology is the theory of knowledge ontology or metaphysics is the theory of reality and axiology is the theory of values Now, philosophy goes beyond facts and values and seeks to explain and interrelate them epistemology look at the greek origin episteme means knowledge or understanding and it refers to the nature and origin of knowledge and truth etc it proposes that divine revelation not necessarily i'm not talking about the religious sense experience logic and reason and intuition these influence how teachings learning understandings are come about in the classroom and also in the research setup ontology and metaphysics and it considers questions like what is real what we are seeing is it real or is it just a perception so considering the reality as an external creation or a internal construct again has a deep influence on the beliefs and the perspectives axiology is more about principles and values ethics and aesthetics ethics is the questioning of morals and personal values aesthetics is examining what is enjoyable what is tasteful and what is desirable so when we are looking at research philosophy what we are doing is to develop knowledge in a particular field the systems and beliefs and assumptions about the development of knowledge that's very very important many times people plunge into some kind of research by simply keeping outcome in mind or replicating a certain process rather than trying to look at the basic systems of beliefs and assumptions at every stage in research we make number of assumptions and assumptions are automatically built in and we proceed further and we don't step back and ask whether those assumptions are really correct 
are valid? I don't know. So all these assumptions which you make are about realities encountered in research. We call it ontological assumptions or about the human knowledge, epistemological assumption, or about the values, axiological assumptions. So all these assumptions individually and together shape how we understand the research question and how do we interpret the findings. So it is very, very important to document these assumptions and also the questions that we have asked about each of these assumptions and then proceeded further with some kind of clarity as to why we have assumed something and why we should proceed further. So this will form the basis of the choice of methodology, the research strategy, and the data collection techniques and subsequent analysis procedures so that all the elements of research fit together. Now we will move to the next portion which we call ethics. It's also called uh, moral philosophy. And again, interesting, it's a branch of philosophy. This involves systemizing, defending, recommending concepts of what is right and wrong behavior. When we look at etymology, it says relating to one's character, which itself come from character, moral nature. And later on, of course, they traveled all around and then came into English. Very abstract, difficult to understand, even more difficult to practice. Not because we don't understand, but we always go with a colloquial meaning, at least not to do something which is wrong. So what is wrong? So what is not desirable? So this is a big question. That is where, as we see a little later, Whatever the quotes we draw, whatever the procedures law we bring, the interpretation in terms of the right and wrong becomes very, very important. So it requires much more explanation and mentorship than just codification. So again, going back into ethics, we can further go into meta-ethics concerning the theoretical meaning of moral propositions at the higher plane, the normative ethics, the practical meaning of determining the moral course of action, or the applied ethics in terms of what a person is obligated to, what is permitted to, what he can and cannot do in specific situations, or in a domain of action, or in a given uh, circumstance, or given in a particular society. Research ethics involves application of the fundamental ethical principles to the research area, namely design, implement, and research, particularly involving human experimentation and animal experimentation. The medical science, natural science, many of them go into the animal side. The other research gets into studying people and studying things on people and studying things by the people and studying things for the people. So all these various aspects of academic scandal, including scientific misconduct, et cetera, et cetera, all of them are all offshoot of not having comprehended what should be the right ethics to be applied in a given domain or a given circumstance. So ethics broadly, we know is a moral principle of right and wrong. Research ethics, incorporating ethical principles into research practice when right from the research intention and the idea itself and then beyond complete of research and the publication of research therefore research ethics refers to a diverse set of values norms and institutional regulations which will help constitute the and regulate the scientific activity, or we can say scientific research technological activity. So it is to ensure that the research is conducted in a way that serves the interests of individuals, but not just the individuals, but groups and society as a whole. So the 
ethical soundness the protection of confidential the process of informed consent are all very essence of research ethics we will see these things very very briefly trust is the bedrock of everything the entire research program is built on a foundation of trust this is the trust the results reported by other researchers are data providers right and that we believe they are sound society trusts that the results of the research reflect so the individual the institution backing him or her they reflect an honest attempt to describe everything accurately and then without bias and that society takes it for granted and when they find it otherwise data hell breaks loose and let's not give occasion to go to that level but this trust will endure only if the research community devotes itself for upholding transmitting true values associated with the entire ethical research conduct i talked about informed consent what does it really mean in any research on or with human beings each potential subject must be adequately informed not just informing that i am coming to do experiment on you i am coming to take information from you but the aims methods source of funding sometimes any possible conflict of interest and the institutional affiliations of the researcher and the anticipated benefits and also the potential risk of the study and sometimes the discomfort to the respondent either immediately or even delayed must all be communicated properly not just communicating or educating them we should also give them the right to abstain from participating in the study or withdraw consent at any time right and after ensuring that the subject and the study is understood this information and the intention then the researcher should obtain the subject's freely given informed consent preferably in writing if for some reason the particular subject or the respondent cannot give it in writing then at least the non written consent must be formally documented witnessed and also countersigned by the research supervisor right or the institution therefore the various ethical issues to be taken care of are taking responsibility to secure actual permission and interest of all those involved not to misuse any of the information obtained or discovered moral responsibility maintained and duty towards participants and protection of rights of people and all these ethics must be honored totally at all times except perhaps some extraordinary circumstances of national international calamity where some disclosure may become necessary i'm not going to read this through these are the listing of many many codes of ethics which have come about in the last uh, uh, let's say 5 to 6 decades nuremberg code medical association declaration belmont report all of them so all these ppts and the background material are available i would request the fellow researchers to go through many of them they are available some some of them are online some of them in the library but it is suffice to say that so many codes of ethics have come about and still we are talking about the need or codification or new codification or regulation or direction of ethics so we can understand that mere statutes laws and procedures listed are not adequate probably some kind of ongoing education and appreciation is necessary and that is where perhaps this attempt by ugc has come in at the right time again the essence of courts and policies i don't want to be reading each one separately i'll just read only the headline and one or two 
key points. Honesty. Again, so many times explain, mention, but again, the question of interpretation. But when you go into details of it, which talks about honesty in reporting data, reporting results, reporting methods, and in publication. Meaning that don't fabricate falsified data. Sometimes what happens in the urgency, outliers data are trimmed out without even discussing the genuine reasons with even the supervisors sometimes and many times in the paper. And again, certain statistical techniques which we use, right, may not be appropriate, but we just camouflage by using three, four techniques and then choose one or two to expound our costs. Objectivity, again, it's a very, very important aspect where when it comes to design of experiment, data analysis, then expert testimony, other aspects everywhere. Minimizing and preferably avoiding completely bias or self-deception is what is required to be objective. And disclosing personal financial interest, which has come about in the process of research is also very, very important to make sure that we have been very, very objective all through. Integrity. Keep all the promises, agreements, act with sincerity, consistency, and thought action. Now, when we talk about honesty, objectivity, integrity, some will be people say, yeah, yeah, mostly we are objective, you know, all the most of the time we are integ we have integrity, and that's nothing like most of the time. Pardon me for saying it. There is nothing like uh, half pregnancy, anything, either one is pregnant or not. So that way, either you are in it or you are not in it. Again, carefulness, errors, negligence, keeping of data and keeping research data and also the research notes for at least eight to 10 years is very much necessary so that it is not only helpful the individual or the other researchers to do further research based on the research already conducted, but also for the individuals themselves to go back and revisit and then confirm and reconfirm the basis, right? And use it for any purposes. Openness, unfortunately, in the research community, data is not shared, ideas are not shared, Everybody is suspicious of the others. And being open to criticism and new ideas is a hallmark of researcher because the researcher is supposed to be open-minded and be willing to stand to criticism, to look at it dispassionately, detaching himself, coming out and looking at himself as we do it in NLP techniques. So this is very, very important to be as open as possible. And respect of intellectual property, giving credit where it is due, proper acknowledgement of all the contribution, sometimes never knowingly plagiarize. That means unexpected creeping. So it is very, very important. There are tools available now. So before the, the draft is finalized, it becomes necessary to go through whether without or knowing that any extract we have taken from somewhere, that origin is suspect. And while conducting the review of literature, we must acknowledge the contribution of other people in the field of relevant prior work. And it also serves as a benchmark for checking those contributions and the genuineness and veracity of the same. And finally, responsible publication. Avoiding wasteful duplicative publication, publishing same paper with some modification in multiple journals without telling the editor, submitting same paper to different journals. So all of them. And most importantly, responsible mentoring respect for colleagues who are involved in the research process, the students, subordinates who help us, who themselves will become researchers later. So 
we should be able to set an example to them by being responsible, by being responsive to them and not discriminating the colleagues and students on the basis of our uh, presumptions and assumptions on the basis of sex, race, or ethnicity, or whatever. Then protection, we talked about protection of data, protection of material, and protection of human subjects. We talked about informed consent. And similarly, if any animals are to be used in any of the researches, the animal care also becomes important. Competence. The word is pronounced so many times, grossly misunderstood, misquoted. Maintain, improve professional competence, expertise through lifelong education learning. Many times people said, ah, PhD a gaya, finished, my life is done. And that is where really the life starts. Okay. So the lifelong education learning is very, very important. And then only the professional competence can not only be maintained, but enhanced to one's own benefit and for the benefit of other researchers. Social responsibility, all whatever we have so far talks directly, indirectly about social responsibility, that we should be doing things for social good and be relevant. And legality, very much necessary. If people are able to self-regulate, then legality doesn't even come into the picture. But unfortunately, legality is necessary. Laws are required because self-regulation many times fails for multiple reasons. But we are not going into that now. So all this relationship between courts, ethical practice, and the law is very, very complex. It is difficult to understand. We can sit for two days. We can also have another 20 hours, 30 hours of class, but it's not enough. And everything becomes in order, right? Will it become by applying courts and law? Not necessarily. Because all these courts and laws, whatever we have got so far, what we are going to frame are general in nature. And they fail to provide many times clear operative guidelines in complex specific cases where judgment may be subjective based on the research ethics committee itself. Who is going to sit and evaluate what has been done is right or wrong. In many areas, the courts and laws are not specific about research practices. And even research practices, which are good in certain circumstances, in certain disciplines, may not be good enough in some other disciplines. And particularly when the research happens to be in a multi domain area where two, three domains come together, and we need to have comprehension of all the domains for research. And there's always the question, what is legal, but not ethically correct? The example of practice of Nazi Germany may have been legal, but they're clearly immoral. That is why for the last 40, 50 years, we have been grappling with a lot of courts, laws, rules, mechanisms, and probably it is one more attempt at the right time that we are trying to have with the UGC initiative and our DSU has taken up the cudgels and right away we are moving forward. And my sincere thanks to Professor Rashi Narendra for having given me this excellent encouragement opportunity and to Dr. Bangasar and Nagraj Subarao. And particularly, Nagraj Subarao, Rahul Dike, our registrar sir and VC sir, in the last many years, they've had a substantial impact influence on me for their vision and daring to experiment new things for the collective good. And that gives me enthusiasm, motivation, not because of the occasion I'm saying it. I've really felt that I have been able to learn a lot of things in the last so many years. And working with them is very exacting. And that is why it is exciting. I suppose the partnership will continue. Be safe, be secure, all of you and family. God bless. So any clarifications, questions, I'll see to the best of uh, my understanding, we can discuss.
shall i put off this uh, switch off this uh, ppt yes sir uh imtiaz so chat box can you make it open what do i do our participants can ask questions also need not be muted yeah participants please ask any questions that you have yeah gold sir madam sailaja yeah please go ahead ask your question i think she has to be unmuted or something Very good question, sir. Good morning, sir. Can I continue? Yeah, sure. Yes, uh, yes. sir. Uh, the session was really very useful. Uh, one small thing, sir. And UGC is insisting on good and uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, without plagiarism uh, papers why can't we have some good softwares i have faced lot of issues when we had to check for uh, plagiarism online uh, so do you have any idea whether we have any online software that we can check the Hello, sir. Sir, you will be answering. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Krishna Kumar, sir, will you be answering this question, sir? Madam. plagiarism uh, software question uh, we will be addressing in the last session ma'am so we will be describing the, to you all the tools that are available online okay ma'am thank you so the, in the last session tomorrow ma'am uh, the yes. yeah thank 6th you. august uh, dr pratima guru prasad will be addressing on plagiarism <laughs> also ma'am whenever you are publishing uh, it's always better you look at the list of the predatory journals so the predatory journals basically tell you uh, i mean you should not be publishing in those in those list of journals there the content is not very authentic so any other question uh, ma'am i want to ask one question yeah tell me uh, actually i have collected some of the data from the hospital related to my research work okay and based on the results which i obtained i have uh, uh, sent i have made a paper and submitted it to one of the journals okay uh, the reviewers are happy with the results and all but they are expecting me to share the data however when i consulted the hospital authorities now due to the data privacy regulations and all okay. uh, i am not uh, getting a what you can say certificate from the hospital data regarding the sharing of the data okay. so now in this situation what can be done but have you concluded something using that particular data uh, concluded as in ma'am my findings are suggesting some of the things like which uh, how the healthcare can be improved uh, using the machine learning Okay. so a few results uh, i have obtained yes i cannot this, no, this is not the right platform where i can discuss out my uh, results okay, okay. Uh, but uh, yes definitely it is remarkable now the review comments which i obtained from the uh, the journal uh, reviewers hmm. they seem to be excited and even they are like yes it is very much needed in india but uh, 
दे एक्सपेक्ट मी टू शेअर द डाटा तो आय एम हेल्ड अप ऍट दिस सिच्युएशन ओके ओके सो maybe uh, can did you find out from the hospital authorities whether uh, actually ma'am from the hospital uh, authorities the stuff was like i was provided the uh, like uh, the yeah, data yeah that only it is for the research work and that too i i must thank dr banga because of his influence because initially as you know because of the data regulation rules it is like no hospital share that data Okay. just because of his influence and his these things somehow i had got the data but i am not having the permission right now yeah. but what you can do is maybe you can have some kind of a disclosure that it is only for the reviewers but you will be not putting any of it in the publishable material so that also can be done oh you do okay. not be putting it in the paper i mean for everybody to see but uh, oh, no no ma'am now my concern is because if i send the data to the reviewers i cannot uh, be very sure of i cannot take a certificate from them that you will not be sharing it no, the no, data no. and I all feel, that i feel you can write to the reviewers telling that yes i have now i have it's been nearly 2 3 months i have uh, written this thing that due to the rules and regulations i am not able to share the data please suggest uh, any of the things where i can make it available to them but not for all Yeah. so but they are not uh, means uh, after that there is something a uh, complete silence i have not re- obtained any kind of reply from them okay wait so, for a reply for them otherwise then go to a reputed journal no that's what ma'am actually like just now you told about that we should be aware of the predatory journals and all that now the journal which i am referring to is a elsewhere journal the medical uh, journal which is published by india so okay. it is one of the very reputed journals but since i got a cold reply and since it's already 3 months now i am in a dilemma whether to take out my paper from that journal and to submit it to some another journal uh, now i am in a like crossroad uh, kind of a situation no you i uh, one more attempt you make in writing because it's since it's a good journal normally i triple e and all those things take at least a year's time you know Ah, that's what, ma'am. Actually, I had submitted my paper in uh, December last year, December two thousand nineteen. Okay. I got the first review somewhere in uh, March. Then the second review was in May, related to the data sharing. After that, it is a silence. Now I do not know what else to do. Maybe so I see. Some... I mean, you try to get around where uh, specific any comments are there. Maybe just share one or two images if necessary. and then the rest you keep it to yourself you know better not to share it share everything okay so you, you okay you mean to say like whatever data i have i can just uh, give a selectively a... selectively just to please them that you have submitted some authentic records you know so that you can do maybe that also is there okay with iiee i did that when i had my findings so okay. uh, they wanted some reference i told them everything i cannot put it because uh, it is uh, basically done for defense so apart okay. from it they asked me to put so that's all i did and that really did, does not convey much of the information but that was okay. for the review okay 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 ma'am okay um, this is a good suggestion which you are giving me but what i was thinking is like whatever my results are there maybe if i share the complete data and then they will be cross verifying the results or something So, not really they don't cross verify it is only some okay, okay, okay. they will have specific doubts so that's all they'll be clearing that's all okay okay so shall i put up a mail again to these people that uh, the some selective part i can share with them yeah, surely yeah. okay 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 krishna okay. kumar sir sir will take over the thing any any questions any questions to sir um, can i ask a question Hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Good afternoon, ma'am. This is Shama Jain, Virginia Scholar from DSU. Yeah. Hello. Ma'am, I am working in an engineering institute in Bangalore itself. So my question is, sometimes when you are going to present a uh, paper in any conference, so for getting any financial uh, sponsorship from the college, they ask us before going, like they they want to sanction some OD or if suppose some financial, they want to help us, they ask. to give our paper to them so is it fine before presentation if we give them our paper um, means 
we should give or we should tell them no we can't give like this uh, for this is for which uh, which particular program you are talking about ma'am i am working in an engineering institute okay so, od purpose on duty purpose when we are sanction we are taking some leaves if we are going outside of the bangalore so we need for 3 days or 4 days sometimes to go okay so they tell ki if you really want to earn od otherwise it will be lop so for that they ask us to give us a paper Okay, you need to show us the paper. What is the quality of? Only that to that time we will apply your. Just give them the front page of the abstract. I think that should be good enough. Okay, uh, not the full paper, na? No content. I would actually you have to keep some, especially when you are publishing your thesis. You know, uh, you don't want uh, uh, to be. I mean, you should keep certain amount of data for you. That's actually, the actually in their HR manual they have wrote it very clearly. That if you really want to have OD or if you want to help uh, take any financial help from the institute, <laughs> you need this kind of uh, criteria they have put the in their HR manual. And the front page, you know, that should be more than good enough. I think that should be. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, madam, good afternoon. This is Manu. I'm a PhD scholar in DSU Management Department. Yeah. my question is while we doing the data collection do we need the uh, copies of the data collection which we collect from the uh, people yeah yeah sir you must have copies of all of that okay even actually my area is the marketing okay. uh, i am doing a survey research. you are doing some survey sir yes sir survey retailers yeah. For that, I cannot use the Google form and all. I need to go visit all the retailers and write down all their points in the paper. But Do you better need... keep, sir, because especially I, I am from the electronic side. I keep all my, I did keep all my experimental results, sir, because you never know uh, what and what queries will come uh, for your thesis, you know. So you, it's better you have all the proof and everything, whatever oh. you done. So. Oh, okay, ma'am. Thanks. See. Yes, sir. So, sir, shall we conclude the session? Krishna Kumar, sir. Okay, so I think sir is uh, left. So, thanks a lot, uh, Krishna Kumar, sir, for providing insights on the importance of uh, research and publication ethics. Uh, also on covering about the predatory journals and a list which must be checked by every researcher before they publish and also on covering different aspects of philosophy and of course uh, moral philosophy which is the ethics part so uh, i think we'll conclude this session and uh, start the next session at uh, 1:30 with uh, dr reddy from mahe he'll be talking on uh, Uh, scientific uh, conduct and uh, publication ethics thank you for participating thank you a lot for attending the session thank you ma'am thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you everybody yeah thank okay. you all bye yeah, thank you ma'am okay Thank yeah, you, ma'am. So thank you very much, sir. So we will communicate uh, the questionnaire sent to, by all the people individually and write to them. Yes, sir. Surely, sir. An evaluation of that, much. and I'll keep informed of the. Yes, sir. Uh, total. Any help needed question. from my side, you can surely ask. No, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank very, you. Very nice talking to you. You have been a great help. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. So we'll adjust. We will join at one thirty. Yeah, we'll join at one thirty. Thank you. Imtia, sir. So we will uh, conclude yeah. the session and join at one thirty. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Thank oh. you. Thank Wish you. All Thanks of you have a, a good lunch. <laughs> Thanks a lot for recording and hosting the session on. Thank you, Imtia. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.